They were looking at symmetry. They were put, put two motor mounts here and two there. It's perfectly symmetrical. They never thought anything of it until they drove it down the road and it almost fell apart. Um, the same thing happened in airplanes. Some of the worst airplane designs had the exact same problem. They'd hit a resonator in frequency and the wing could literally just vibrate on. The same thing is kind of true on trumpet. The thing is there's no adverse effect. You just miss a note. Um, like if I'm going to try to play an F or a G above a stem on a box Stradivarius, then the first thing I'm going to do is try to put some, something on here to make it more efficient. So I created the trim kit, which is what you're asking about. They have your bottom caps and top caps and sometimes the finger buttons as well. And that's because the box Stradivarius has that exact same parallel type problem as the Model T did. Um, there are certain notes you can play where the anti-node, and I'm not going to get too technical here, but if you want to hear more, ask me later. The anti-nodes actually line up in exactly the right spots on the horn to where suddenly a, a, a note, a specific note or a range of notes, is very difficult to play. F, F sharp, G, A flat, A. One or two or even all of those notes are sometimes a serious problem on a Bach Stradivarius 37 model. The reason is the anti-nodes line up in just the exact right pattern so that that note has more disruption or more interference than all the other notes. And because it does, you always miss that note and people think again and again, wow, I, I just really have to work on playing a high G. I'll play it in her one and two. Or I'll play it open. Um, how can I play my A? I'll play it third down or one and two. You know, there's all these things we've tried to do all these years that really were not necessary. It was just a fluke in the design. And because they were fairly consistent in the way they built them, most box have it. And the ones that we think are, wow, those are amazing, those were the ones that weren't right. And they play better. So like if you pick up a box strat, somebody says, I picked this horn out of 20 horns, my teacher helped me, he's a great orchestral player, you've heard this story before. He picked up this great box, it was better than all the other ones. It was actually the one that wasn't right. And because it wasn't right, it didn't have that problem, which was a consistency issue with a poor design. I shouldn't say a poor design, just a design that had a flaw. Because I love uh, box driver races, I love the sound. When I was young, it was by far the best horn I ever thought I could own. And uh, I wanted one for many years. Um, and I wish I could have met Vincent Bach, because it sounds like he was a really interesting man. So um, yeah, the reason that we put the bottom and top caps on horns now is to prevent this tube, the, which we call the um, valve casing, from literally drawing vibration out of your horn to the ends. And it's kind of a natural phenomenon for things to be attracted to whatever has more mass. Like if you're out in space, I'm sorry to get into so many subjects, but I just do this. If you're out in space and uh, you put a feather in space, and then you put like a little BB in space, a little copper BB. Then the feather will be attracted to the BB and eventually it'll start to create uh, an actual satellite, satellite type movement around the BB. It's a weird thing. Um, and that's true of any objects you put in space because it's a vacuum and there's no gravity. And because there's no gravity doesn't mean there isn't no gravity. It's, that's a misnomer also. The BB has mass, which means it literally creates its own gravity. It has more gravity than the feather. It draws it to it. The same thing happens in a trumpet. Uh, if I'm losing lots of energy throughout here, then there's vibration. But because these cylinders have more mass, then they literally draw it to that point. And unfortunately, they draw it right out the end. So if you were to measure the vibration of a standard trumpet, um, and you can do this uh, a few different ways, but um, when I was in college at St. Olaf, I studied this um, basically with a, son a sonogram, you know, and uh, with a sonogram, you could see that the energy was bleeding or vibration was coming out, literally, right here and up here. And you put a microphone down there, you could hear the trumpet better down here than you could all the way up to the bell. It was a really weird thing. So we were losing energy, and uh, by capping those off, we prevent it from vibrating, and that's because there's so much mass here that it actually prevents it from vibrating. So. There's kind of a tipping point. If you have a little bit of mass, more than the rest of the horn, it'll draw it to that area. But if you create enough where it's too much for your energy to actually cause vibration, then you've just saved energy. Um, so we have different bottom caps from all different horns. Different makers make different side bottom caps. Typically, if you want to sound really bright and harsh, most people will put the lighter ones on. If you want to sound 
uh, I guess with a more solid attack and more uh, even overtone series or, or a, a lower end overtone series, then you put heavy bottom caps on. So, and top caps do the exact same thing. Uh, I haven't found any tendency for it just to be bottoms, it's both. There's also a theory I'll bring up. A lot of people say you should just put one heavy one on the third. I've never found any evidence of that. Uh, it's always been best when you have all three. Um, so again, uh, you know, there's a lot of different information out there, but that's what I found. Any other questions on uh, the acoustic sufficiency? All right. What did I say? Yeah, you know, just one. So one or the other, but not. I mean both. Top and bottoms. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, typically you want top and bottom because if you put just the bottom caps on, then it will still want to vibrate. Really um, and what I really should do is create a video of a sonogram doing that, which has been on my list for years. I have a sonic, I have an ultrasound machine, um, but I haven't set it up to, to really video these, these concepts and to show everyone. Mainly because um, I'm too busy building horns and doing what I do. Uh, but there have been like a percentage of people that want proof and want the physical evidence of how this works rather than just listening with their ears. And that's fine too if you want proof. Um, one of these days I'll have to set up. <laughs> All right, other questions about uh, physical efficiency? All right, I don't know how much time we have, but I was gonna move on to mouthpieces for a few minutes. Okay. Um, mouthpieces can be efficient in a lot of different ways, or inefficient. Can you just a little bit? Sure. All right. I'll just Great, thanks. Perfect, then I have something to get there too. So, uh, mouthpieces, really that's the part that's a lot of times overlooked until one day you say, wait a minute, I think I need a different mouthpiece. And when you have that aha moment and the light bulb goes on, then you go to the internet or the store or you ask your friends, what was that one that you got? And you find out that there's this wild range of mouthpieces and all these options. And websites will tell you, you know, certain cup shape will do this and certain rim shape will do that. And it gets very confusing. Um, most trumpet players are, I would say the majority of them that are switching equipment, are looking for more consistency, better endurance, and unfortunately more range. I'll say this, um, the mouthpiece is a key part to all of those. I'm not always uh, convinced that those always should be your, um, your goals. It really depends on where you are in your, in your musicality and your, uh, your progress on trumpet. But um, I try to avoid the range issue because to learn how to play high consistently is uh, it's kind of like learning to do the high jump or learning how to do some very difficult athletic event. Um, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of practice, it takes a lot of knowledge, or you could just be good at it. And that's what makes it so frustrating. Um, some people, you'll see some guy as uh, the youngest guy in the band and he has the best range of endurance. And you'd be like, I don't get it. I've been practicing for 10 years. And I, how can that guy have it? He doesn't even care. He's a physics major or something else, you know? It, you know, so that can be the frustrating part, and what I always tell people if you're focused on range, is unless your range is um, below, say, a G above a staff, if it's below that, then yeah, focus on range and endurance and take lessons from someone really reputable. But if you can comfortably play a G all day long above a staff, I'm not talking high G, just the G below high C, just keep working on it, you know? Um, there's no reason to try to go play high right away. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how you can learn to do that as well. So mouthpieces, they come in all different shapes and sizes, and really what you need to know, the key concept here, is you need to plan the mouthpiece that fits you. And uh, it's easy to say, but it's not like you can go down to the local mouthpiece shop on every corner and say, well, this is my mouth size, and I'll give you the right mouthpiece, like you would be fitted for shoes. Um, if you imagine it a little bit like being fitted for shoes, then if you were really fitted for shoes, let's say you were playing in a professional sport, you would go down and probably to some special store with a trainer or someone, you know, I think it's really uh, crazy expensive and detailed when they get into that sort of thing, but they'll literally measure every part of your foot, they'll even put it on a special sensor. Um, 
my friend John here actually is involved in the making of orthopedics. They get very serious about this kind of stuff. And uh, they do all that so that they can fit you for that thing. But it gets even more layered than that. If you have an injury over here, then they can alter or raise or lower arches and things. And I don't know the technical details. Um, if you're being fitted for a ski boot, it's completely different than being fitted for basketball shoes, so on and so forth. 